We want to find the volume of the solid of revolution given by rotating the area bounded by the two curves, f of x equal to minus x squared plus 3x plus 1, and g of x equal to x plus 1 about both the x-axis and then the horizontal line y equals 1. First, let's sketch both of these curves just to get an idea of what shape we're looking at. So the second one's a line. The first one is just a parabola facing down. We'll need to know where the two points are equal to get an idea of what our shape is. So if I set the two functions equal to each other, move everything over to the right-hand side, we're going to get x squared minus 2x equals 0. Factor that, and then we see that these two graphs intersect at 0 and 2. So I can plot the two points off the line there. Since I know that these two functions are equal to points, I can just draw in a downward-facing parabola on top of the line. And there's the region we're going to rotate. So let's take a look at our picture once we've rotated. So what I can do is I'm going to take a look at the section that cuts my solid through x on the x-axis. Okay, so I just take that, I pull that out. That's going to look like a washer. What are some of the features in this washer? Well, for the big circle, notice that this is just the height above x going all the way up to my top function, which is f of x. For the inside circle, we're taking a look at the height above x going all the way up to our bottom function, which is g of x. So I have two disks here, and we're just going to take their difference in areas. So my section formula for area, so a of x, is going to be pi f of x squared minus pi g of x squared, or top squared minus bottom squared. You want to keep it nice and geometric. Let's set up our volume formula. So that's just going to be take the definite integral from where the two curves intersect. So that's going to be from 0 to 2 of pi f of x squared minus g of x squared, the sectional area function. And we notice that this thing is going to take some grind work to get to an answer. So I'll just talk through it, having already done the work. So notice this, well, there's no easy way out of that. We just have to expand it, and that's going to give me this mess here. This one I'll leave as it is, since it's easy to take an antiderivative of, and we can just tack on that to this mess when we're done. So anyway, I want to take the antiderivative of all this stuff. So here it's a whole lot of add one, flip it over. And then this one here is even add one and flip it over. If you do the u substitution, u equals x plus 1, and then the derivative of x plus 1 is just 1, so it antiderivatives very nicely. Okay, I rigged my functions to make sure a 0 comes out at the end, but we still have to be careful. It's going to be really good for all these terms. We just have to stick a 2 in. Putting a 0 in goes to 0, so we don't have to subtract anything. But be careful on this last term. If I put 2 in, I'm going to get 27 over 3, which gives me a 9. But if I put 0 in, I get 1 third. So that's not going to go to 0 like you would love to have. We're going to pick up a term over here when we put 0 in. So anyway, working everything out, we have a whole bunch of numbers here. And we'll notice when we clean it up, we get 96 fifteenths times pi. Now let's rotate around the horizontal line, y equals 1. Our picture changes now, but the idea is still the same. We're going to have a, a washer, which I represent as a big disk with a little disk pulled out of the middle. Take a look at the picture. Since I'm rotating around the horizontal line, y equals 1, I really don't care about this region below the line, y equals 1, and above the x-axis. So what's happening here? Our radii are going to change. So before where we thought of the radii as being the height being equal to the value of, say, f or g evaluated at x, 
now things are going to be a little bit different. So the radius here is going to be the height, but we have to start at the line y equals 1. So what does that leave me with? Well, for y equals 1, that means there's 1 between the x-axis and y equals 1. So what's going to be above now is just f of x minus 1 for the big circle. Okay, that's going to be from there to there. For my little circle, same idea. Before the height would have been g evaluated at x, but now I want to get rid of that part below the line y equals 1. So what's left over is g of x minus 1, and that's my new radius for the little circle. Let's see what we get. So this actually makes a situation that's much nicer than the one we had before, because these functions are a little bit nicer to integrate. So for the big circle, our radius is minus x squared plus 3x. And then for my little circle, I'm just going to wind up with x itself. Let's set up our volume formula. So here, we're just going to take pi, radius of big minus radius of small, and expand. And then we're going to go from 0 to 2. OK, well, I just follow my nose and expand. OK, we wind up taking the antiderivative of this thing here. So it's add 1 and flip over. And then you notice we don't have to worry about 0 now. Putting 0 into this gives me 0 coming out. So it's all just sticking a 2 in. And then when I follow my nose, I get the 56 over 15 times pi. In the first one, it was roughly 6 times pi. This is roughly 4 times pi. So one thing that we can believe in, at least, is that the volume of the first one is going to be a little bit bigger than the volume of this one. And that makes sense, because if you think about the first one, we're doing a much wider circle. This one's going to have a much smaller circle that we go around. So this one will have a smaller volume. 